Welcome to the Catholic with the Bible podcast. My name is Ted, a Catholic who, yes, reads his Bible. So a couple episodes ago, I talked about a woman named Mary of Anstown. I talked a little bit about how much I didn't really know the history of Christianity within Japan. Because really, the limitations I had on my understanding of Japanese history was tied to what I knew from this anime show I watched when I was a kid. And the show was called Roroni Kenshin, which took place during the Meiji era, which took place after the very turbulent Edo period. And upon doing some research, I stumbled upon a story that I learned about back at Baptist camp, the story of the hidden Christians of Japan, that there were these Christians who the rest of the world had no idea that they even existed because they basically had to worship underground for about 150 years during the Edo period which is a pretty powerful story, but that's actually not the story I'm going to be talking about today. Before these hidden Christians, the Kakure Karishitan, forgive me, I'm going to mispronounce a lot of stuff today. Before they were worshiping underground, the Christians, they actually had a place in Japan. A little bit of history. Francis Xavier was a Jesuit who came to Japan in 1547. And really, he didn't have a whole lot of resistance. The Japanese government thought, you know what? Buddhism came here. It meant more trade opportunities. Let's do it. Bring on your uh, other little religion there. We don't care. So they did. It was actually very successful. The big concern that the Japanese government had was the cultural piece of it, the political piece of it. But they figured, you know what? More trade opportunities. That will never be a problem. But... They had more than just that. There were only 35 priests or so, but Christianity exploded. Even though Christianity grew like it did, there was a bit of a problem. It wasn't just that Christianity was getting traction. The problem was people were more or less embracing just Western ideas in an Eastern culture. And that was the concern that the government had. So they put in what I would refer to as a soft Christian ban. So yes, Christianity was going to be practiced. They put in this ban back in 1587, about 40 years later. And that just kind of was to say, hey, tone it down, do your thing, but watch yourselves. We are an Eastern culture, not a Western culture. Alessandro Valignano, he came and he pushed for an authentic Christianity. He was another Jesuit and he really pushed for an integration into the Japanese culture. Yeah, do your tea ceremonies. Yeah, bathe as much as they do because the Japanese bathed way more than the Europeans did. And, you know, things continued that way for about five plus years until the Spanish Franciscans showed up, which, yes, Christianity was brought to Japan to spread Christianity. But if we're being honest, trade was also on the mind of the Portuguese. But when the Spanish showed up, that got to be a little bit more than the Japanese were really okay with. And unfortunately, there was a merchant ship that was heading to Mexico but crashed in Japan. And their response to try to get out of being in trouble because they weren't supposed to be there, they started talking trash about how great of a country we are and how Spain is so powerful. Mm, not the right thing to say. Because at that point, severe Hostility came upon the Christians. Even though a proper anti-Christian ban would come up in 1614, it was about a year after the San Felipe incident that 26 Christians were martyred. There wasn't really a big event other than, okay, this is getting out of hand. You guys need to knock it off. And they responded appropriately. This isn't just some cultural thing for us. This is, this is our everything. This is something we're willing to die for. This is so important. Because of this, February 5th, 1597, 26 Christians were crucified. Not in the same way that Jesus was, where he was nailed to a cross. They were tied to a cross and then stabbed and then left to die. And of the people that died, there were Japanese, there were Franciscans, there were Jesuits. They knew this was coming. They knew that ban was in place. So every day when they went out, they knew we're not safe promoting Christianity. They knew that they were evangelizing, but they were evangelizing what was important. We don't care 
if you have Eastern culture, whatever, we don't care. I mean, you guys have your Shinto stuff. You have your Buddhist stuff. We'll challenge that, which a lot of the Japanese government were not okay with Buddhism at the time. They were standing up for what was important because they knew it was something that the world needed to hear. And they knew it wouldn't be safe. And ultimately, they knew this is something that is worth giving your life for. That is something that Jesus Christ showed them. I bring that story up because Mary knew that her child was going to be in danger. Remember, Simeon said, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign that is spoken against. And a sword will pierce through your own soul also, that thoughts out of many hearts may be revealed. So despite the joy that she probably heard at the meeting with Simeon, the fear would have to be doubling up. If she hadn't already thought about it, I don't know how she wouldn't have. It was at the forefront of her mind. But years later, the event that we're looking at here, Jesus gets separated from his parents for days. I couldn't imagine losing my child for more than 15 minutes let alone in a world where there's no 911. The police, the authorities, they aren't able to communicate in any way other than by word of mouth. So if he is found, they wouldn't know. But after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. But when Mary and Joseph came in and they said, what, where were you? Jesus's response could be translated a couple of different ways or what this actually means. We hear, didn't you know I'd be in my father's house? Cause that sounds safe, but him saying something that was more akin to, didn't you know I would be about my father's business? Translation. He didn't say, don't worry, mom. I was safe. He said, I was doing something important. And we know that those 26 martyrs from Japan, before they died, if their families were to ask them, why are you doing this? Didn't you know I would be doing the father's business? I never said I would be safe. Didn't you know I would be doing something important? So this is the first time we see Jesus speaking in any way. And he was speaking to authorities the teachers, the people who who dedicate their lives to the knowledge of this stuff. Some kid coming up and asking inquisitive questions and and making and making grand declarations to them about the way that things are, possibly challenging them. And despite even just the religious connotations, being out and about in the world with no security blanket, doing the father's business. I'm sharing the message of the gospel right now from inside my house in a closet. And I'm not going to lie. Sometimes I feel a little self-conscious about that, but this is important. We should all be about the father's business. We should be sharing with the world, the beauty that is the story of Jesus Christ, just like the 26 martyrs did. Living in this day and age, in this country, anyways, that's pretty safe. But for some reason, we still hold that back. But today, I'm going to say it again. We should be going about our father's business. So to help this ministry grow, please share this with a friend. As I've said a million times, I'm not some grand theologian. I'm not a priest. I'm not a pastor. I'm just a Catholic who's reading his Bible. And I want you to read yours too. Luke chapter 2, verses 41 through 52. Each year his parents went to Jerusalem for the feast of Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up according to festival custom. After they had completed its days, as they were returning, the boy Jesus remained behind in Jerusalem, but his parents did not know it. Thinking that he was in the caravan, they journeyed for a day, 
and looked for him among their relatives and acquaintances. But not finding him, they returned to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were astounded at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you done this to us? Your father and I have been searching for you with great anxiety. And he said to them, Why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he said to them. He went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them. And his mother kept all these things in her heart. And Jesus advanced in wisdom and age and favor before God and man.